And we are, are happy and proud to welcome to the stage, uh, uh, the stage Mr. Peter Schiff, who is our keynote speaker for today. And he joins us fr um, from Euro Pacific. He's the investment committee chairman uh, of Euro Pacific Asset Management, CEO of Euro Pacific Capital, uh, widely renowned as a bold contrarian regarding his views on the US economy and his approach towards investing in international markets. Uh, he achieved national notoriety after he publicized his views on CNBC, CNN, Fox News, Fox Business, and other financial political news outlets as being one of the few strategists to have accurately forecast the financial crisis well in advance. Um, Peter also authored the New York Times bestselling Crash Proof 2.0, uh, along with other books such as The Little Book of Bull Moves in Bear Markets and The Real Crash. Uh, he's here joining us today to share his current views of the global economic landscape and what he believes is in store for investors as we enter the second half of a uniquely interesting decade. Peter Schiff. Thanks, everybody. So let me tell you about what I think is going on in the U.S. economy in particular, but also in the global economy. And I think, in general, the conventional wisdom about the true state of the U.S. economy, I don't think has ever been more wrong than it is right now. And, that, and that's saying a lot, you know, because I've um, lived through a couple of bubbles. I remember the, the 1990s, the latter 1990s quite well. Uh, so many people were fooled uh, by the promise of the internet and the new era, and people were piling into these money-losing dot-coms um, you know, with crazy valuation metrics. And at the time, I thought it was very irrational, and I sat out the bubble, and it was difficult for a couple of years, particularly 1999 was one of my tougher years as an investment advisor, um, you know, hearing people talk about how foolish I was and how much money I had cost them by not buying these stocks. And that bubble burst, and uh, it was a pretty big payday for, for me, not because I was short, but because I didn't lose anything and because I was buying what nobody else wanted uh, during the late 1990s, and all of my stocks did very, very well. Uh, in the years that followed. And so, you know, we did very well by just not getting suckered in uh, to the mania. And then I saw the same thing again leading up to the 2008 financial crisis with real estate in particular as I rented my house for years while other people, uh, you know, were making fun of me for all the money I was giving up by renting. Um, I ultimately, I just bought a house um, not too long ago, a few years ago, and I ended up paying, I think, half less than half of what the prior owner paid in 2002. Uh, although I think at one point, the house that I bought was on the market for three times what I paid. So there were a lot of paper profits there. People pretended that um, you know, houses were going up, but the reality was it, it was all an illusion. But I, more important than just the housing bubble itself was the phony economy that that bubble helped to perpetuate. And the, the way in which investors, and, and portfolio managers were, were conned by what they believed to be a genuine economic recovery. It was really a bubble masquerading as a recovery. And they, they didn't understand the consequences that lie in their future. And the consequences that we ultimately had in 2008, 2009, actually pair in comparison to what they would have been had the government done the right thing. See, when I wrote my, my first book, the, and, and I've written several books since, but the, the book that, you know, became a, a, a New York Times bestseller, well, that's the first one. My most recent one also is. But the first book was called Crash Proof, How to Profit from the Coming Economic Collapse. And that book was written largely in 2006. I started it in 2005, and it was finished by mid-2006. Because if you've ever written a book, you pretty much have to finish it about seven months before it's published. And of course, you have to write it before you can finish it. So I started it in 05, right? And initially, the book was going to be just about the housing bubble. You know, it was going to be called like America's, you know, nightmare or just how the American dream is going to be the American nightmare. And it was initially going to be about the housing bubble and what was going to happen to the economy when, when the bubble burst. But I didn't see how that was going to help me business wise because I was a stockbroker. And so I wanted to write a book that might lend itself to helping me get clients. So I figured, all right, look, I have to write a more inclusive you know, book 
not about just a housing bubble. So that was really a chapter in my book. Um, but the, the crash that I was referring to is not the one that happened in 2008. And a lot of people will say, you know, you predicted the financial crisis and the crash, which, which I did. But what happened in 2008 was not what my book was endeavoring to prepare people for. Right? It's the crash that's about to come. See, when I wrote that book, I said that the United States economy was literally a house of cards, that it was built on this foundation of a housing bubble, that we had too much debt, uh, too much speculation, and that when the real estate bubble burst, we were going to have a financial crisis because I understood how leveraged the banks were uh, to the real estate market. I wrote that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would go bankrupt and how all this was impact the economy. I wrote that when the housing bubble burst, that we would have the worst recession since the Great Depression, that we would have double digit unemployment, that we would have trillion dollar a year federal budget deficits. All the forecasts that I made back in 2005, 2006 came true. I didn't put a date on it. I didn't know that it would happen in 08. I just knew that it was coming. And one of the things I was worried about when I was writing the book is that it would happen before the book was published. Right? Um, and, and so it happened, the book came out in February of 07, so it still had a little bit of a lead time. In fact, the book was, you know, almost off the shelves, you know, because it came out a little bit too early. But fortunately, by the time the financial crisis hit, I had about the only book on the stands that was still gloom and doom. And so it, it, had, it actually sold a lot more uh, later on in 08 than it did in the year it was published, which is usually not the case for a nonfiction book about the you know, economy and the stock market. But it got a new life in 2008 when, when everything really started hitting the fan. But the collapse that I was writing about right, was not that big recession. It was not the financial crisis. That, I believed, was going to be what was going to set it all in motion. Because when I wrote that book, I diagnosed the US economy with this disease. But I wrote that that disease was not what, what was going to be fatal. It was going to be the government's cure that was ultimately going to kill us. Because I wrote that what the government was going to do in response to this financial crisis, and this is before the crisis happened, I said they are going to make the mistake of trying to reflate these bubbles. They are going to slash interest rates, they're going to print all this money, and they're going to try to get stock prices to go back up, they're going to try to get the real estate market to go back up, and that, the consequence of that is what's going to destroy the economy. Because you have to understand that the financial crisis or the housing bubble of 2008 and the stock market bubble were both created by the Federal Reserve. And, you know, Alan Greenspan likes to claim that it wasn't his fault, that he was just doing what Congress wanted him to do. But the bottom line, it was the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve that inflated these bubbles. Sure. There was some help from the government. If it wasn't for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac insuring all these mortgages, even though interest rates were so low, we wouldn't have had the housing bubble. But without the low interest rates, it would have been impossible. All of the teaser rates that were fueling the bubble, all the subprime loans were adjustable rate. They all had low rates for the first year or two. And why was that possible? It was because of the Fed. Had the Alan Greenspan not lowered interest rates to 1%, there would, be, there would have been no fuel. I mean, we had Fannie and Freddie for generations guaranteeing mortgages and contributing to the moral hazard, yet we didn't have a bubble of that proportion. It was the Fed that supplied the air that was missing in the decades past. And more importantly, if you remember when Alan Greenspan finally raised interest rates, he raised them very slowly, right, a quarter point every time the Fed met. Why did the Fed do that, right? The Fed knew, right, that we had a housing bubble, even though they didn't want to admit it, and so they were afraid of pricking it. So the reason they raised interest rates so slowly is because they felt if we do this, we'll give the market and the economy an opportunity to kind of transition from a low-rate environment to a normal-rate environment. But it backfired on the Fed. Because the Fed raised interest rates so slowly, it actually allowed the bubbles that they were afraid to prick to get even bigger. So that by the time interest rates got up to a normal level, the bubble was that much bigger, and so therefore the fallout was that much greater when the bubble burst. So the financial crisis, the, the, the big recession in 08, and the smaller one that we had in 2001, was a result of bad monetary policy. Now what happens during bad monetary policy when you have interest rates too low, 
you create a lot of malinvestments. You, you, you create a lot of mistakes, right? It's like when you get drunk at a party, you have too much to drink. Maybe you do a lot of foolish things that you wouldn't do if you were sober. But then the following morning, you know, you sober up, and then you, you remember all the dumb things you did the night before. That's kind of what happens when you get all this cheap money and people do dumb things like buy these money losing dot coms or, you know, buy these, you know, overpriced condos. When the cheap money goes away and, you know, they realize, you know, what a fool they were. And so you, you have a recession when the market tries to correct the problems that were built up during the boom. Right. And so you try to reallocate resources into more productive uses, more efficient uses. And that process, that recession, can be painful because it means that people have to get laid off you know, from the wrong companies before they can get rehired from the right ones. It means that people are going to lose money. And, and generally, politicians, though, they don't like recessions because the voters don't like them. I and they always want to do something. And the impetus is, well, we have a recession. Let's stop the recession. How do we fight this recession? But the recession is actually the cure. What you should fight is the phony booms that make the recessions necessary. Right? And generally, the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. But the government never allows a natural correction. So because the, the, the government intervened in 2001, 2002, because Greenspan did not allow a, a, a more protracted and deeper recession, which was necessary to cure the problems that were created by the bubble that preceded the bust, because we, we, we lowered interest rates to 1% and kept them there for a couple of years, that's why we had a housing bubble, and that's why we had the big recession that we had in 2008. But here's the problem. What Ben Bernanke did in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis is off the charts reckless, much bigger than anything that was done under, under Greenspan. The bubble that Bernanke has inflated in stocks, real estate, bonds, is more spectacular. The malinvestments that have been made over the last five or six years are greater you know, on, on an order of magnitude. And the collapse that's coming is the one that ultimately destroys the, the economy. That's the one. The crash that's coming, maybe it's going to happen now in, 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 20, in 2015 or 2016. But this is the one I was writing about in 2006, 2007. It may have taken a little bit longer than I thought between the bursting of the housing bubble and, and this next crisis, because I think I, I might have overestimated the intelligence of the rest of the world to figure out what the problem was, because they still don't know. See, most of the people who had no idea that the financial crisis was coming, and it was a very predictable event, it wasn't hard to see coming. But most people thought it was almost impossible because they didn't understand. The people who thought the economy was in such great shape in 2007 didn't understand the problem. Well, they still don't understand the problem because they think the Federal Reserve solved it. They didn't solve it. They made it all worse. In fact, because we haven't seen any real adverse consequences yet, people now believe that the critics of the Fed, like I was criticizing the Federal Reserve when they first started quantitative easing, talking about all the problems that were going to happen. And they're still going to happen. But because it's been so long and people don't perceive that we've had this crisis, they now think that the Fed has been vindicated, right? That the Fed is, you know, that the Fed, what the Fed did is work. That's why everybody thinks the U.S. economy is in such good shape. They think, well, it worked. QE worked, right? The zero percent interest rate worked. And so they think now the Federal Reserve can, can take off the training wheels and everything's going to be fine. Well, the problem is QE was never the training wheels. QE are the only wheels the economy has. And if you take them off, the economy is going to fall over. But that doesn't mean you can keep them on, right? Because if you leave the wheels on, then you, you go over a cliff because that's the direction that we're headed in. See, people think that QE can end. It can't end. Why, why did we have quantitative easing three, QE three? Because QE two did not work. And why did we have QE2? Because QE1 didn't work. Now, I knew that they wouldn't work. I forecast that the Fed would do quantitative easing before they started it. I just didn't know what they were going to call it. I just described it, because really what it is is inflation. Quantitative easing is a euphemism for inflation. 
right? It's just printing money, buying government bonds, monetizing government debt. That's all it is. But they want to give it a fancy name so it doesn't sound as ominous as what they're really doing. But when they first started it, Ben Bernanke always pretended that he had an exit strategy. And I always said that the Fed was lying, that there was no exit, that once they went down the QE road, there was no turning back. I called it a, a monetary roach motel, right? And when they ended QE, I said, well, they're going to do it again. And sure enough, they did QE too, right? And then I, back then I started saying, well, they're going to have more QEs than Rocky movies. And when they ended QE2, they had QE3. And in between there, they threw in Operation Twist. If you remember that one, I called that one Operation Screw at the time. Um, but then they had QE3. And now they've ended QE3. And everybody thinks it's the end of it. It's not the end of it. It's just a prelude to QE4. Why? Because QE3 not only didn't it work, it actually made all the problems worse. Right? Quantitative easing is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. Right? It can't work. Right? The more gasoline you put on the fire, the bigger it gets. And so that's what's going to happen. Although sometimes you throw a bunch of gasoline on the fire and it looks like it goes out and then it comes back. Right? It comes back bigger. Well, that's what's going to happen because we've got more debt now in the U.S. economy than ever before. We're more addicted. We're more dependent on 0% interest rates and quantitative easing now than when the Fed first began the program. So if the Fed couldn't give up quantitative easing four years ago, how could it give it up now? Right? Well, we're that much more addicted to it when the problem is that much bigger. And the problem, like any addiction, is whenever you use a drug, you build up a tolerance. So the more drugs you take, the more you need. For people to think that we could take away all these drugs, that we could take away quantitative easing, right, and the economy is not going to implode, that the stock markets are not going to go down, it's like thinking you can stop taking drugs and stay high. Right? You can't do that. If you want to stay high, you need the drugs. If you stop taking drugs, you're going to go through a withdrawal. Right? That's the recession. It's like, you know, it's like a withdrawal from drugs. But that's always resisted. In fact, if you can go back to when Ben Bernanke, when they first launched quantitative easing, they specifically said that the goal of this program is to make the stock market go up, to make the real estate market go up. And why did they want to do that? Because they said if we have higher asset prices, right, we're going to have more wealth. And that wealth is going to trickle down, right? It's trickle down monetary policy. People are going to have more spending. And so we're going to build a recovery on the wealth associated with the rising asset prices. Well, that, that's exactly how we got into, into trouble because that's not real wealth. When you base your spending on paper assets and you lever up to spend money that you don't really have, that's not legitimate wealth. The way you create wealth is through savings, through underconsumption, through capital investment, innovation, production. That's what grows an economy, not what we're doing now, just levering on up. In fact, we just had... Uh, the elections. And you know, I've been saying all along that there's no recovery, that we've been in recession for the entirety of the Obama presidency. And that's why the Republicans won seven Senate seats. Three quarters of the voters said the economy is going in the wrong direction. This election was a referendum on the economy. It wasn't about, you know, voters, you know, embracing the GOP. They weren't looking for a small government. Two of the states that ousted Democratic incumbents and elected Republicans also voted to increase their minimum wage. Right? So the voters don't get it. They don't want less government. They're not for the free market. They're just upset right, that their standard of living is going down. The cost of living is rising, right? and their incomes are falling. And so the results of this election, you know, you got all these Wall Street guys scratching their heads trying to figure this out. Hey, why don't these guys realize how good the economy is? Because it's not good. This is exactly what was going on in 2007 when, you know, the polls were showing how unpopular Bush was and people could, why isn't Bush getting credit for the good economy? Because it's not good. And that's why Obama's not getting credit for the good economy, because it's not. It's a lousy economy. So, well, the unemployment rate is down to 4.9 or what is it, 5.9% 5, or whatever it is. Yeah. But why is it down? Is it down because the unemployed got jobs? No. It's down because the unemployed stopped looking for jobs or they decided they, they finally threw in the towel and they took a part-time job because they couldn't get the job that they wanted. 
In fact, one of the main reasons that so many jobs were created in 2014 is because the extended unemployment benefits ended in December 2013. So a lot of jobs that people were turning down because they were hoping for something better and they were just collecting unemployment, this year they had to take those lousy jobs that they were turning down. The other thing is that a lot of older people, right, if you look at all the jobs that were created in 2014, net all the new jobs went to people 55 and older. Why is that? Why are people in their 60s and 70s working? They don't want to work. They want to you know, be retired. They want to play with their grandkids. They want to play golf, but they can't afford that anymore. Thanks to 0% interest rates and rising food prices and rising electrical prices and rising health care costs, retired people have to get jobs. That's not a sign of an improving economy. That's a, a sign of a, of, of a deteriorating economy. Meanwhile, on net, right, net in 2014, we have lost full-time jobs. In fact, if you measure the number of full-time jobs in the economy from the beginning of the recovery till right now, we have over a million fewer full-time jobs. How do you have a recovery that's destroying jobs? We have over 7 million more people working part-time who want to work full-time than we had when the recovery began. During this so-called recovery, real wages have declined, right? and the average net worth of American households has diminished substantially. And this is the recovery. If it's this bad in a recovery, imagine how bad the next recession is going to be, which is about to start, by the way, because we're now five, six years into this expansion. That's about how long they last, historically, if you go back to the Second World War. So we're due for the next recession, which I think is going to begin in early 2015. I think, I think probably the GDP that we're going to get in the first quarter of 2015 is going to be negative. I think they're going to revise down the GDP number that we just got for the third quarter, which was 3.5%. I think they're going to revise that down maybe below, below 3. And I think the fourth quarter uh, is going to be horrible. It's going to be a terrible Christmas. People have been saying it's going to be the best Christmas. No, it's not. Uh, so we'll be lucky to get a GDP number in the twos for the fourth quarter which means the entire GDP for 2014 is going to be lower than it was in 2013, which in 2013 was lower than 2012, which is why rather than raising interest rates, right, everybody thinks the Fed's going to raise rates next year. No, they're not. They're going to launch QE4 because before they get around the raising rates, we're going to be back in recession. And it doesn't matter about this recent rise in the stock market. Without new QE, the market's going down. The real estate market's going down. The stock market's going down. That is the air that keeps the bubble inflating. And you, people, you know, people are thinking, well, maybe that's not the case because the Fed ended QE and we got this rally. Well, you know, Japan came in and promised some more cheap money out of there, and people are looking for maybe some QE to come out of Europe. And so they think, okay, well, if the Fed's out of the game, well, at least we got Europe, at least we got Japan in there to print all this money. But it's not going to be enough, and I'm not even so sure that Europe is going to come through. And of course, all this is bad monetary policy, right? I mean, the whole pretense, you know, why should we print all this money? Everybody is saying we have to stop deflation, right? Deflation is this horrible thing. And if we allow it to happen, it's, you know, it's economic Armageddon. None of that is true, right? Falling consumer prices is a very healthy thing for an economy. It is the result of a vibrant, growing economy. If you grow your economy legitimately through production, right, you create abundance. And by doing that, prices come down and everybody enjoys a higher standard of living because you can buy more things right, with your income. Historically, you know, that's what we enjoyed in the 8, 19th century, 20, the, certainly the first part of the 20th century. But you had constantly falling prices in the United States and we had you know, tremendous economic growth. You know, the, the, the uh, economists will try to say, well, you know, if we have falling prices, people won't shop, consumers won't spend, which is nonsense. There's a law in economics called supply and demand, and it's a law, like the law of gravity. And what does supply and demand say? As price goes down, demand goes up. The economists want us to think that as price goes down, demand goes down. It's no. When prices go down, people spend more money not less money. So falling prices stimulates, encourages demand. It's rising prices that diminishes the capacity of people to spend. 
So if you're trying to create demand by rising prices, you're going you're, you're to achieve the opposite result. So what is really behind all the rhetoric? Why do central bankers want inflation? Because it doesn't help their economies. The reason that they want inflation is to sustain asset bubbles and to wipe out their debts. You've got a lot of governments that have borrowed too much money. Politicians have lied to voters. They've promised something for nothing, and they can't deliver. And they don't want to honestly default, so they want to inflate away their obligations. But they can't just say, we want to print money to wipe out our debt or to sustain asset bubbles. So they have to make up this lie to say, well, we're doing it to help the economy. We have to make sure that we have inflation, that it's too dangerous if inflation is too low. I mean, there's never been a period of time. It used to be if a central bank had inflation that was 1%, they would brag about it. Hey, this is great. Look, our inflation is really low. Now, if your inflation rate comes out at 1%, oh, my God, what are you going to do? It's, you, know, you need more inflation. As if it's some kind of necessary ingredient to economic growth. It's not. And especially as an investor, that's your big enemy. Inflation is destroying your purchasing power. It's robbing you. Right? It's a transfer of wealth from the saver, uh, the wage earner, to the government. It's just like a tax, but it's a very surreptitious tax because people don't understand that they're being taxed. And the biggest irony is the way governments now measure inflation. They've, they've altered it so much that the numbers are low. Like in America, the way we calculate inflation, you know, the numbers we get are too low. They say inflation is one and a half, two percent a year. But if we calculated it the way we did back in the 70s or 80s, it'd be five to 10 percent a year. So they change the methodology for calculating inflation so that it, 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 it guarantees a low number. And then they complain that we don't have enough inflation so they can create more of it, which is their, their goal all along. But again, if I'm right, and if the inflation rate is not 1% to 2%, but 3 4 5 6%, then that means that the economy has been contracting all of these years. Because when we take GDP, we have to deflate it. And if the deflator is too low, then the result is too high. And if I'm right, which I think I am, and the economy has been contracting, that would explain the outrage among the public. That would explain why the labor force is, is shrinking, why labor force participation is the lowest it's been uh, since the mid-1970s. And it's not because people are retiring. They're not retiring. They can't afford to. Right? And labor force participation among men is at the lowest it's been in the history of the republic you know so even our per capita energy use is going down all the actual anecdotal evidence is consistent with a shrinking economy not a growing economy but yes we have record stock prices sure because of all the inflation um, we have record uh, real estate prices but the average american isn't even benefiting the average american doesn't own stocks anymore because he's broke he lost his money in the in the stock market collapse he doesn't own a house anymore he lost his house in a foreclosure in the real estate crisis. In fact, home ownership now is at a, what, 20 something year low, home ownership rates. Uh, just last week, I think uh, purchase money applications were at the lowest it's been uh, in 19 years, home mortgage applications. And first time home buyers, it's now a 27 year low. The percentage of homes bought by first time home buyers at a 27 year low. And I remember, you know, they reported that on CNBC and they were saying, well, why, why is this with all these jobs being created? Why aren't people buying houses? Well, because, you know, the jobs that are being created are, you know, minimum wage jobs. You can't, you know, if you've got a part-time job at McDonald's cooking French fries, you can't exactly buy a house with that paycheck. Um, so all the anecdotal evidence is consistent with a contracting economy. Yet the government numbers say the economy is expanding, but it's the numbers that are wrong. See, they, the media keeps saying, well, there's a disconnect between the public and reality. No, the public understands how bad the situation is. The disconnect is between the data and reality, or in many cases, the way Wall Street wants to interpret that data. I know the fact that anybody can even think, right, that the Fed can end these quantitative easing programs, and there's not going to be a crisis associated with that, doesn't understand the nature of what's going on. And there are some people that will say, well, you know, it's going to be difficult, right? The Fed is going to have to really finesse this, right? The exit is really hard. It's impossible. It's not hard. If the Fed could exit, it would have done it years ago. Why do you think we're still here? Why do you think it's been five years? If this really has been an economic recovery for the past five years, why do we still have QE? They're still doing it. You know, why are interest rates still at zero? You know, when Ben Bernanke first testified in front of Congress, when he first started QE1, 
and he was asked in front of Congress, you're monetizing the debt. This is bad. Why are you monetizing the debt? And Ben Bernanke said, no, I'm not. He said, this is not monetization. He said, because I'm going to sell all these bonds. He said, it's only monetization if the central bank is a permanent source of government financing. I'm going to sell these bonds. We're only buying them temporarily. Well, at the time, I said he was lying. And he was lying, because now it's five years later, and the Fed hasn't sold a single bond. In fact, they have reinvested every dime of interest they've earned. And they've rolled over every maturing bond. In fact, even if they end QE on schedule, they're still doing it, because they've committed to reinvesting all of the interest and all of the principal. Now, of course, Janet Yellen hinted right, that, well, over the, between now and the end of the decade, she, or she didn't hint it, she said it, the Fed is going to bring its balance sheet down to the size that it was um, prior to the financial crisis, which was under a trillion, and right now it's four and a half trillion. That is impossible. The Fed cannot do that because there's nobody to take the other side of the trade. The Fed is the buyer. You can't go from the biggest buyer of treasuries to the biggest seller. Now, one of the things that the Fed tries to do to allay the fears that people have of the Federal Reserve coming in and selling all these bonds and mortgages is they say, well, we're not going to sell them. We're just going to let them mature. But that is a distinction without a difference. See, people think about it superficially. But if the Fed allows treasuries to mature and does not roll them over, what does that mean? That means the U.S. Treasury has to sell an equivalent amount of new bonds into the market to pay off the Fed. And so if the, the, the Federal Reserve is really going to let three trillion worth of debt, three and a half trillion worth of debt mature over four or five years, that's an extra three and a half trillion of bonds the government is going to have to sell in addition to the ones it's selling now. And by the way, they sell a lot more bonds every year than the budget deficit. They're bragging now that in the last 12 months, uh, they, the budget deficit was only $450 billion, as if that's a small number, right? But the national debt increased by $1.1 trillion during that identical time period. So it doesn't matter what the government claims the budget deficit is. It doesn't matter what kind of accounting gimmicks they want to use to get the deficit down. It's the amount that the national debt increases that tells you how much further we went into debt. And so we're already going into debt by over a trillion dollars a year in a supposed recovery. Imagine what happens in the next downturn, and then if the Federal Reserve tries to unload or you know, allow these bonds to mature, there is no way the U.S. government could sell $2 trillion, $2.5 trillion worth of debt into the market and have the Federal Reserve buy none of it, have private buyers buy all that, all that debt. It's like to, to think that it can stop, right? It's, you, know, you, you look at these, uh, you know, the tablecloths, you don't have a lot of dishes on there, but you know, there's a, a trick where a magician will take a tablecloth and yank it right, and out from under the dishes. And if you do it right, you can take the tablecloth and, and not knock the, di knock the dishes down. So that would be a difficult thing to do. It's not impossible because it can be done, but it takes a lot of practice. See, that is not the kind of trick that the Fed is trying to pull off with ending quantitative easing. See, what the Fed is saying it can do is it can yank the table out from under the cloth right? and just leave the cloth and the dishes suspended in midair. That's impossible. The only thing that's propping up the markets is the Fed. Right? The only thing that's financing all the share buybacks and is keeping this whole phony economy going is the Fed. But at the same time that the Fed is blowing bubbles right, and distorting markets, it is actually preventing the real economy from recovering. We can't have a legit, legitimate recovery until we have a legitimate recession, right? We can't erect a legitimate economy that would actually benefit everybody, that would actually create real wealth, create productive jobs that would benefit, you know, a lot of people. We can't do that unless we're prepared to allow this phony economy to implode, which we are not. But this is why, and it's ironic when you have people like Janet Yellen now complaining about the big gap, the widening inequality between the rich and the poor, right? Well, the Fed is the principal instigator of that rift. It's the monetary policies at the Federal Reserve that are enriching the few at the expense of the many, right? Th that is the principal source. I mean, a, a normal amount of inequality is fine. But what we have now is not the natural consequence of a free market. The free market would not produce this type of inequality. It's a government-controlled and manipulated monetary policy that is at the root of it. 
Now, I'm not saying that there isn't bad regulations, uh, you know, onerous regulations and other things that the government does to undermine and distort the economy. Yes, it does. But without the cooperation of the, of, of the central banks, and it was interesting that in a panel just in New Orleans, Alan Greenspan admitted that the Fed is not independent. He said, whoever said the Fed is independent? Well, well, he did. But now he admits that it wasn't and that the Federal Reserve really acts as an arm of the Treasury and it does whatever the government wants. And what the government wants is monetization. The government wants to sustain the welfare state. It wants to pretend that it can continue to give something for nothing. And to do that, it needs a cooperative central bank that will print a lot of money. But as I started at the beginning, we're headed for the end of this. You can't do this forever, right? You can't take drugs forever just because you don't want to come off your high because eventually you, you run the risk of an overdose. And even here's what the government, here's what would happen, right? If, if the government actually let interest rates go up, right? And they can't just go up to 1% or 2%. You know, people say, well, you know, they're only going to go up to 2 or 3%. Interest rates have to go where they need to go. You know, when, when Paul Volcker raised interest rates up to 20%, it wasn't because he thought that that would be a good rate of interest, you know. I mean, but that's where they needed to go at the time. And that produced, up until that point, the worst recession we had had since the Depression uh, with 20% interest rates. So what would happen if interest rates went up to, you know, 6 or 7%, which is still not high? Well, I think that would bring about a financial crisis that would be on the order of magnitude larger than 08. Right? I think that rates that high, I mean, if you look at the real estate market now, even with record low mortgages, mortgage rates in the fours, right, the, the market is already rolling over. And in fact, one of the difference between this speculative bubble and real estate, and I, you know, and I, and I you know, I don't know, know that anybody even did a better job than I did in analyzing the real estate market. We had a, a hedge fund that shorted subprime, and we started in 06, and it returned 800% in 07. And in fact, to show you how clueless people were, and you can see this speech that I gave, it's on YouTube, but I did it in 2006. And one of the main reasons I went to this speech is I was hoping to get investors in my hedge fund. And, you know, it was hard. You really couldn't market hedge funds. You know, you could, you, you, it, there, now you kind of can with the Jobs Act. But back then, you know, you, you couldn't just go out and run commercials for hedge funds. You know, it was very dif you know, difficult to you know, get a guy in. So I was already kind of walking a fine line, you know, and so I couldn't be too promotional. But I was hoping that people would figure it out. So I guess I went to a convention of 3,000 mortgage bankers. And I'm like, okay, these guys ought to figure out that, you know, there's got to be something wrong here. I mean, they're right in the middle of it. So I gave a presentation about how this market was going to collapse and how the subprime market was going to implode and how most of these people would be out of work in a couple of years. Um, and I just really just laid it in. And, and I said, look, you got to at least hedge yourself. Why don't you, you know, I got a hedge fund and we're shorting these subprime mortgages. I explained what they were in the tranches. And I said, these things are at par and they're going to go to zero. And out of 3,000 people, one person called me up in a couple days and invested. One person. And, um, yeah, and he made, you know, you know almost, ten, maybe, I think the guy was in one of the, I think he made like 10 times his money, whatever it was. He did really well. But one guy out of 3,000 got into the fund. And I had spoken at that conference the year before in 05 and pretty much said a lot of the same stuff, except I didn't have the hedge fund back then. Um, but I was talking to get with a lot of big people in the real estate market. And I wish we had that one on YouTube. They, I don't know where that, that, that one was. Um, but we had the, the 06 speeches up on the Internet. Um, but this real estate bubble is very different because back then it was a lot of, you know, mom and pops. It was a Main Street bubble. This bubble that's going on now is all about private equity and hedge funds. I mean, they've bought up all these stocks. They've taken a lot of cheap money, and they've bought foreclosures and distressed properties and, uh, you know, forced sales. And, but they, they've loaded up on single-family homes, and it's a huge bubble because they've overpaid for a lot of these houses. A lot of them are vacant. They can't even rent them out. And when interest rates start to go up, these mar houses are going to come on the market for sale. And one of the differences is if, if you've got a mortgage and you're underwater, the bank's not letting you sell. But if you paid cash for your property, you just sell. There's no one stopping you. In fact, you know, so let me take a 20% hit, 30% hit, cut my losses, right? Just like selling a stock. 
you know, there's going to be a lot of real estate coming on the market and the prices will just implode. And the real buyers, right, are, have less money. The actual buyer, if you had to sell these properties from the speculators and find an actual buyer who can afford the down payment and the mortgage and qualify, how much the prices would have to implode to make that a possibility, right? So rising interest rates would collapse the real estate market. And I believe that all the banks that were too big to fail, that got bailed out in 08, 09, those banks would fail. If interest rates went up, especially with all the long bonds, I mean, what, what's a 30-year mortgage worth? If you got a 30-year mortgage that's paying 4.5% and treasuries are at 7, what's that mortgage worth? You know, and even your treasury portfolio. So a big spike in interest rates will collapse the banks. And of course, if the Fed is raising interest rates, there can't be any bailouts. The Fed can only bail out banks if it's easing, not if it's tightening. So if rates are going up and the banks are failing and the Fed is leaving interest rates up, then the banks fail. But not only do the banks fail, not only do the bondholders lose their money, but the depositors lose their money. See, none of the depositors lost money in 2008, 2009. But if the Fed is raising rates and we have a financial crisis, the depositors will lose money because there's no money in the FDIC unless the Fed creates it. There's no real reserves there. I mean, they're tiny. Yeah, if a small bank goes, yeah, there's money. But if, a, if Bank of America fails, there's no money to back up those accounts. And then what about the government? What about the federal government? We've got a $17.9 trillion national debt. So let's call it $18 trillion, because it'll be $18 trillion in less than a month. And before Obama leaves office, that'll be $20 trillion, right? So let's just take that number, because it's easy for me to do math with $20 trillion. Well, if interest rates just went to 5%, Right, what's 5% of 20 trillion, right? One trillion. What's the government spending now on interest on the national debt? Less than 250 billion a year. But if the interest goes up to 5% and the debt is 20 trillion, that's a trillion dollars a year. Five times what we're paying now. Where would that money come from? And that's only at 5%. And remember, the average maturity is very short. You know, when, when Volcker raised interest rates to 20% in 1980, whatever, when, or 18, whatever, when the, it didn't affect the government that much because most of the national debt was in 20 to 30 year maturities. Now it's like an adjustable rate mortgage. So interest rates go up, then your rates really go up. Where would the government get that money? There's no, there's no place to get the money. Right? The, government, the government would be insolvent at 5%. But what if, it, what if rates went to 10%? See, they, all, they want to create a lot of inflation. Well, what if they succeed, right? And inflation starts to flare up. What if inflation, what if the CPI measures of inflation get to 5 or 6%, 7%? What are they going to do? They have to raise interest rates up. If you have 7% inflation, you can't fight it with 2% interest rates. That'll just fuel the fire. If inflation is 7%, probably 10% is the minimum interest rates can be, maybe more. So at 10% interest, you're talking about $2 trillion a year in net interest. That's every year. The government would be lucky to collect $2 trillion in taxes with interest rates at 10%. The economy would be in shambles. I mean, this phony economy you know, that, we're, that we're living off of. Of course, that's what we need. We need higher interest rates in order to, get a, in order to encourage savings and discourage consumption and, and speculation. In order to really rebuild the economy, higher interest rates is exactly what we need. But the problem is we can't get from where we are to where we need to be without all that pain. Like you can't get from a drug addict to, you know, to sobriety unless you go through the rehab. But they don't want us to do that. So the government just, you know, they can't let the interest go up. And now, you know, we used to have these debt ceiling battles, right? And the debt ceiling, you know, now they suspended it. So there's really no ceiling until I think middle of, middle of next year. But this whole thing is one gigantic Ponzi scheme, right, for the, for as far as the federal government is concerned. And higher interest rates would expose it. So they have to keep it down. In fact, you know, if you remember, every time we used to have these battles, right, over the, the budget, the bu debt ceiling, what did they always say was going to happen? They would say, well, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default on the debt which is what they would have to do. If interest rates went up to 5 or 6%, the Treasury would have to default. They can't pay. Paying is impossible. They've already acknowledged that. 
So, but they say if, if we can't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default. Well, that is basically an official admission that it's a Ponzi scheme. Because the government doesn't say, you know, you don't have the president or the secretary of the treasury or the chairman of the Fed saying, well, if we can't raise the debt ceiling, we have to honor our bonds. So we're going to have to cut other government spending. We're going to have to cut Social Security or we're going to have to cut uh, Medicare or we're going to have to cut government pensions or maybe we're going to have to have an across the board tax hike so that we can pay our creditors. No, the government says if we can't borrow more money from other people, we are not going to repay what we owe our existing creditors. That is the exact definition of a Ponzi scheme to the T, right? You're paying off your current investors with the money you get from your new investors. And the government says, we'll keep on paying off the old investors as long as we can find new suckers to, to give us the money. But if we can't do that, whether because on their own they decide they don't want to do it or whether some statute prevents us because of the debt ceiling, we're, we're going to default. You know, and I'm not the only person who says the government is running a Ponzi scheme. I remember when, um, when Bernie Madoff was first put in jail, he did an interview, I think it was with the New York Times, and he said, he accused the U.S. government of running the world's biggest Ponzi scheme. He said, look, you think I, you know, I'm nothing compared to the government. You know, what I did is small potatoes, right? The government's running a much bigger Ponzi scheme than I did. And when he, when, when he said that, everybody was very dismissive of Bernie Madoff's remarks because they said, well, you know, who's he? Or why? He doesn't have any credibility. He's Bernie Madoff. And I back then, I said, well, wait a minute. He's got credibility about one thing, right? Ponzi schemes. Right? If, if Bernie Madoff says you're running a Ponzi scheme, you're running a Ponzi scheme, right? And that's, that's why I said at the time that we shouldn't have him in jail. We should make him the Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> because Bernie Madoff understands, right? And, he, and Ponzi 101, and this is what I don't understand. See, the most important thing about running a Ponzi scheme is not telling anybody it's a Ponzi scheme, right? But we told everybody. We tell the world, it's a, if we can't borrow more money, we're going to default, right? We've told everybody. Well, if interest rates go up, it's the same thing. You know, what, why, did, why did Greece have a financial crisis? You know, because Greece had all this debt for years. It wasn't until the interest rates rose that they had a problem. As long as rates were low, they can pretend that they were solvent. The same thing in the United States. As long as rates are low, we can pretend we're still solvent. You know, we're spending less annually on interest payments on the debt than we spent when Ronald Reagan was president, even though the debt was a small fraction of what it is today. And that's all because of the Fed. So if interest rates go up, the housing market crashes, the stock market, of course, crashes. And think about all these companies that have done all these buybacks. You know, they've been borrowing up money and buying back stock. What are they going to do when interest rates go up, right, and they're short-term bonds? Because a lot of them, it's not 50, 100-year financing. A lot of these companies have three-year, five-year financing on their share buybacks. Interest rates go up. Now what do they have to do? They can't, they can't keep the debt, especially when their revenues are down. And now all these companies that were buying back stock have to sell stock to repay their bonds. But meanwhile, the stock market is tanked, and now they have to issue new shares. So the stock market would really melt down. Uh, with high interest rates because their, their, their interest expenses would explode, uh, their revenues would come down, and their, you know, now the bonds would mature and they're not going to have the cash. So the stock market would crash, the real estate market would crash, and the government would have to default on its debt. Is that the likely scenario? Is, that, is, the, is the Fed going to let that happen? No. So what are they going to do? They're going to do what I was afraid they were going to do back when I wrote Crash Proof. And that's why I wrote that my last book is called The Real Crash just to remind people that the crash we had wasn't it. It's the one that's about to happen. And it's going to be when they launch QE4, right? Because they have to prevent all this. They can't allow this next downturn to happen because it would be worse than 2008. And so what are they going to do? They will sacrifice the dollar. So right now, the dollar's been bid up. Gold's coming down. Because people are deluded. People think, again, that the Fed succeeded, that the Fed's plan worked, and now that because it worked, it can be ended. And now we can you know, raise interest rates and go back to normal. Right? And that because it works so well in America, Europe is going to do it. They, they, you know, they resisted it originally. They went for austerity, which they re didn't really do. I guess compared to us, they were austere, but not you know, compared to what they should have been. And the austerity should have been on the government side, right? That's real austerity when you cut government spending. That liberates the economy. 
It's not about raising taxes on the people who are working. It's about cutting the spending. It's about cutting all the benefits for the people who are not working and getting them to contribute. Um, but what Europe did was less reckless than what America did. But in the short run, if you take drugs, you get high. And, it, in, and, and you can mistake that for legitimate uh, economic growth, which is what Wall Street and everybody has once again did. Just like they did all the growth that we had from 2002 to 2008 was an illusion. It was never economic prosperity. Right? It was just a bubble. And when it popped, that was reality. And, 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 and because the Fed came back in with more of what ailed us, then uh, we, ex we exacerbated all the problems and we postponed that day of reckoning to, you know, the next couple of years. So everybody is expecting, you know, the Fed to raise rates and, and this QE program. And so that's why the dollar's gone up and, and that's why gold's gone down. But what's going to have to happen is at some point, the Federal Reserve is going to come up with an excuse as to why it has to restart quantitative easing. Because it has to do it. Uh, it just has to figure out a, a reason. Right? Now, the one thing the Fed can't admit is the truth. See, they can never say the truth that we have to do it forever. Because the only reason it can appear to be successful is because people are under the misconception that it's temporary. So they have to pretend that they can stop. That's why they had to pretend that they had an exit strategy, even though there is none. Right? So they're going to come up with some excuse, some unforeseen thing that happened, you know, because the Fed has a very rosy, you know, outlook for the economy. But then again, it's always had one. And, and part of it is just their own bias. I mean, if you actually have people on the Federal Reserve who believe that quantitative easing is going to work, then because they think it's going to work, they factor it into their, their forecasts, right? But there's another reason that the Fed is always optimistic. Even if they're pessimistic, they will lie. See, the Fed, the Fed thinks that they have a role of talking up the economy because they actually believe that they, what they say matters. And if Fed officials actually are worried about the economy, they're never going to say that. Why? Because they're afraid that expressing their concerns will actually bring about the decline they're worried about. If we say we're worried, then businesses will react to that. They might hold back on their hiring or hold back on their investment, and we're going to set into motion the very thing that we're worried about. And so what the Fed always wants to do is be the cheerleader for the economy. If we just say how great things are, well, then businesses will make the investments and they will hire people. And to some extent, that's true. But it's also bad because if the Fed is optimistic when it shouldn't be, and if businesses react to that optimism by making investments or hiring people that they shouldn't hire, that's not good for the economy. Because when they found out that the Fed was wrong, now they have to undo those mistakes and there's a cost there. And I think we're going to see that because you've had, I believe, a lot of optimism that has been built in over the course of this year. Maybe companies have fired fewer people than they otherwise would have if they had a more realistic outlook on the future. Maybe they're holding on to people, hoping for this recovery, because they, they've been told by so many people that it's around the corner. Well, when it doesn't come, now they're going to lay off people that they should have laid off months ago. You know, so this improvement that we've had in unemployment is, is, is temporary. Right? And so as the economy begins to, begins to weaken, then they're going to come in, and then they're going to do um, another round of QE. And I think this is going to be... A, a big wake-up call for the markets because people are then going to start to connect the dots. I mean, why they haven't connected them already, you know, is still beyond me. But again, I think I've overestimated the intelligence of other investors for most of my career. But they eventually figure it out. It takes a while. But when they realize that, wait a minute, we've just gone through an entire business cycle. We've gone from recession, recovery, and back to recession. And we've never raised interest rates. Interest rates were at zero the entire cycle. This is the new normal. The Fed can't raise rates. Why are rates at zero? Because that's the most we can afford. We're so broke that zero is all we can afford. Right? And the only thing that the Fed can vary is how much QE it does. Is it, and is it, is it 
ramping it up or tapering it off. The Fed just announced the end of QE. That is the end of the tightening cycle. This is as tight as the Fed is going to get. The next thing they're going to do is ease. And it's going to be in the form of either a brand new QE program or they just ramp this one back up. So I don't know what they're going to, what they're going to name it. In fact, I have a feeling that this next stimulus is going to be coupled with a fiscal stimulus. Because I think there are enough people that are upset about people getting rich off of quantitative easing, they're going to want to let the little guy in on it too. And they're going to say, look, we need a stimulus for Main Street. And we might get a tax cut to make the Republican Congress happy and more government spending to make the president happy. And so we blow a bigger hole in the deficit. They're going to say we need to put more money in the pockets of Americans so they can spend it. You know, they got to bass backwards, right? The, the, we don't, Americans don't need to spend more. We've already spent too much, right? The real solution is that Americans stop spending and start saving. But if you have a bubble economy ba based on spending and you want to perpetuate the bubble and they run out of money and they run out of borrowing capacity because they're leveraged up already, they have a mortgage or they have a car loan, a student loan, credit card debt, and you want to keep this bubble going, right? You want to encourage consumption, but that's the worst thing you can do. But when they do that, then I think this dollar rally collapses. You really start to see a collapse in the dollar, a big increase in commodity prices and consumer prices. And at some point, right, at some point, the CPI will be rising at a rate that's too rapid for the government to claim it's a good thing. It's going to be too much of a good thing, right? It's maybe when inflation gets to 3%, you know, they can still say it's okay because we'll average it out. And I said this, remember when unemployment, when the Fed first said we're going to raise interest rates if unemployment gets to six and a half, right, I said, that's a lie. I said, I don't care where unemployment goes, they will never raise rates. They will move that goalpost if it's ever hit. And of course, that's what happened because now we're well below six and a half percent, but they haven't even considered a rate hike. The same thing on inflation. They'll say, well, if inflation gets to two and a half percent, no, they're never, they're not going to respond. They're going to they're going to say, look, this is good news. We've, we've dodged a bullet of deflation or, you know, we can average it out. We've had inflation below 2% for a long time, so we'll have it above 2% for a while. But believe me, if inflation is 3% on the CPI, it's at least 8 to 10%, if not more, in the real world, right? But the Fed doesn't operate in that world. It operates in the fantasy of government statistics. But then those numbers will get higher, 5%, 6%. And when the Federal Reserve does nothing, Right? See, they keep saying inflation is an easy problem to solve. You just raise in interest rates. Yeah, easier said than done. They can't raise interest rates. They can't fight inflation without pricking the bubble. And the longer they wait to prick it, the bigger the bubble gets. And the, the risk is the overdose of stimulus, where you collapse the dollar and you have runaway or hyperinflation. And the only way we can avoid hyperinflation is to bring about that financial crisis on our own. Because either the American economy is going to be brought back into balance from a crisis that is put upon it externally as the dollar collapses, or we're going to embrace it on our own and do, the right and do the right thing on our own. But either way, you have to understand that as an investor and as, you know, what to do and where to allocate your money. Because this is the critical time. People, people that, that bet wrong in 2007 and 2008 if they held on, they got saved, right? Because the Fed was able to save you. The stock market went down by 50%, yet they inflated the bubble back up. And even if you didn't understand it, if you just wrote it out, you were okay. You're not going to be able to do it this time because the next crisis is a dollar crisis. It's a sovereign debt crisis. And if the dollar collapses, it's not coming back. And some of you might not care, right? If you're managing somebody's money and you're getting paid, you know, a percentage of the profits, and if there's massive inflation, well, then, you know, you're going to win, right? Because if the dollar goes down by 90%, if your portfolio goes up by 500%, your clients have still lost half their, their real value. But on paper, you, you know, you, you made them five times their money, even though that, that portfolio is now half as valuable in terms of other currencies or in terms of gold or, or real purchasing power. So if you want to preserve... The, the value, especially if you've got a lot of fixed income type investments, if you've got a lot of you know, dollar denominated, if you're just clipping coupons and those coupons are fixed, you've got to find a way to hedge yourself. And there are a lot of companies in the U.S. 
uh, that are very dependent on American consumers, whether it's you know, retailers or home builders or uh, people in the credit card industry or the bank. Some sectors are just gonna get decimated by what's about to happen. But also you have to understand how the U.S. fits into the global economy and how the demise of the U.S. economy is actually going to be liberating for a lot of other countries. I mean, people are mistaken if they think that the world depends on America, and so if we go down, we take everybody else with us. It's actually the opposite. America depends on the world. And the more resources that the, word, the world divorts, I mean, uh, uh, diverts to America, the worse off they are. You know, we, we live off the credit of the rest of the world. We borrow money from other countries, and we rely on those, those borrowed money to, to, to import all the products that they produce. So the world has to live beneath its means so that America can live beyond its means. But when the dollar collapses, it's a game changer because as Americans' real wealth and purchasing power collapses, people in other parts of the world are going to see the value of their wealth go up. Their wages are going to be more valuable because they're going to enjoy deflation. We're going to get stuck with a big increase in the prices, but people in China or Southeast Asia, they're going to see the prices of things collapse. And what happens when prices go down? You buy more, right? We all have cell phones. Why do we all have cell phones? Because they're so cheap. When they were $3,000 a phone, Gordon Gecko had one, but very few people bought them, right? Just like the first television set, you had to be you know, very wealthy to have the first TV set, right? And now you, people have flat screens hanging on every wall in their house, right? Why? I didn't, the first time I saw a flat screen TV, it was $10,000, and it was still only like this big. You know, I liked it, but I didn't buy it because it was too expensive, right? So when prices collapse because these other currencies go up, you're going to see a big boom. You're going to see a middle class is just created out of nowhere, and the whole global landscape is going to change, right? Right now, the, the way the world is organized, everybody produces and America consumes. Everybody saves and America spends the savings. When the dollar collapses, it's a whole different ballgame. See, we're the ones that have been riding on the gravy train. We do the easy part, right? The consuming. That's the easy part. The hard part is the savings and the capital investment that lead to the production. The world needs us like a hole in the head, right? There's nothing that says that China can't consume everything that it produces. So you have to understand this gigantic change in this global dynamic when the U.S. is no longer the center of it and we no longer have the privilege of printing the world's reserve currency, which we will not have when this collapse happens. When the dollar collapses, it's not going to be the reserve currency anymore. You know, right now, you know, we fortunately, the best thing America has going for us is everybody else is screwing up too, right? If it wasn't for the problems in Europe and the problems in Japan, there'd be no demand for the dollar. People keep thinking, well, you know, we're the cleanest shirt in the hamper. Right? Well, we're actually the dirtiest shirt, but they haven't figured it out. But because everybody is worried about the other shirts, they're buying ours. Right? That's why you, know, you have people blaming our problems on Europe. You know, the worst thing that can happen if you're trying to perpetuate our bubble economy is for a European recovery right? or Japanese recovery. Only thing I know is they can't recover because they're not doing the right thing either. Right? The worst, that, that's why Japan keeps doing quantitative easing because it doesn't work. That's why they keep doing it. Right? They never want to admit that it's a failure. So when they do it and it doesn't work, they just do more of it. Right? You would have thought the Fed would have admitted QE failed when they had to do a QE2. But no, they just doubled down on the policy. Right? So QE3 didn't work any better than QE2. In fact, it, it was worse because it was bigger. See, the bigger the QE, the more damage it does. And the more damage it does, the bigger the dose you need if you, if you want to stay out of rehab when you, when you withdraw it. But it does take a little while, right? There was a gap between QE and QE2. There was a gap between QE2 and QE3. So there'll probably be a gap between QE3 and QE4, but it won't be long because the economy can't survive in its present form without it. But with it, it can't get healthy, right? So you know that we're not going to have any kind of genuine prosperity it, while we're doing it. But I think this is the end of it. I just can't see them getting away with another round. This has got to be, this next dose has got to be the lethal, you know, uh, amount. And so this is the last time that you have to get things right. And it's almost ironic, too, that, you know, that just on the eve of this, you're seeing, you know, gold stocks falling to, you know, the historic lows uh, relative to the price of gold. I mean, people are so convinced that it worked just before it's, it's about to be revealed as a spectacular failure. 
right? It's almost like that old saying about, you know, things being darkest before the dawn. But it's, you, we're right on the cusp of this. And if you, and if you think, well, Peter, how, how can this be? How can we be on the verge of such a big cataclysmic event and you're the only one that sees it? Well, that's exactly what people said to me in 2007. I remember one interview I did on CNBC, which is still on YouTube, with Mark Haynes, who's no longer around. And he says, Peter, are you telling me? Because I was talking about the housing market. Bubbles are something that happen, you know, once in a lifetime. We just had a big bubble in the stock market. You know, are you telling me that after just a few years, we've got another bubble in the real estate market? I mean, do you really expect our audience to believe this? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. And I said, because it's all the same thing. It's not random. They're not unrelated. The real estate bubble and the stock market bubble were not unrelated. They had the same source. It was the same policy. And all we've done this time is reflate them both simultaneously. And again, the only difference is this time it's an institutional bubble. It's a bubble for the 1%. But just because it's the wealthy and the hedge funds that own all the stocks and own all the real estate doesn't mean it's not a bubble. Just because all the private equity. You know, a lot of these companies now in the dot-com space, the social media, you know, they haven't even gone public yet. And they've got, you know, multi-billion dollar valuations from the VCs. It's still a bubble. But people think, well, because the average, you know, because the cab driver is not in on it yet, it must not be a bubble. Assuming that because these, these, these you know, the, the, the smart money is too dumb to be tricked. Well, they were, they were fooled last time. But this is how. We were on the cusp of a massive economic implosion. I was even debating guys in mid-2008, even after subprime, even after the subprime debacle began. They said, oh, don't worry about it. It's contained. Look at this interview I did with Don Luskin and like, you know, he said, oh, when are you going to stop, you know, with this gloom and doom? You know, nothing bad is going to happen. You know, the subprime, you know, it's come out of the closet and there's no problem. So will you just shut up and stop warning because everything is great, right? This was the mindset, right, on the eve of this collapse. And now everybody agrees, hey, if we didn't get bailed out, it would have been Armageddon. It would have been the end of the world. It would have been worse than the Great Depression. That was the disaster that we were right on the edge of and nobody saw it coming, and nobody at the Fed saw it coming. Now, Janet Yellen gave several speeches in 2005 and 2006 where she specifically said that there's no housing bubble and that the people who are worried about a housing bubble are wrong. And she said that housing prices will keep rising. Even in 2006, she said this. And she said, if I'm wrong and housing prices come down, it's not going to hurt the economy. So there was nobody on the Fed that publicly said anything, even though we were on the verge of this crisis. So you say, how can, thing, how can we be about to go through such a bad crisis and nobody sees it? Well, we just did it. That's how. They never see it, right? Because the people who didn't understand the problem in 05 and 06 don't understand the problem now. And because they don't understand the problem, they think the Fed cured it, even though they made it worse. So you have a short period of time to get your portfolios in order and to get them positioned so that when this game ends and the music stops, right, you're in the right assets, you're in the right countries, you're in the right currencies because you're not going to get a second chance. There's, they're not going to reflate this bubble. It is too big, right? You know the term too big to fail, right? Well, this bubble is too big to pop and the government knows it. That's why they're going to blow air into it as long as they can to delay the ine inevitable. And I th think that's what they've done. Right? And they're running out of time for doing that. I think I'm already out of time. Right? I think I'm over. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, Jim Nelson is here if you want to talk uh, from our office. You know, we recently moved office uh, to Puerto Rico. Some of you guys that are visiting here uh, might want to consider coming down here. If you don't like paying income taxes, this is a place to be. And if you like the beach, sunny, nice warm weather, if you're from, I'm, I'm from Connecticut. Um, so, and it, you know, it's only going to get tougher you know, on the higher income people. They're, they're, taxes only have one way to go, and that's, that's up. Uh, so here, at least you can get, you know, you can get a contract and get your rate locked in at 4%, which is okay, you know. Um, and on capital gains and dividends at zero. So, but we have an office here now. Am I gonna take some questions? Is that why the hands are going up? Do I have time to take questions? Oh, all right, yeah. Well, it depends on what stocks and bonds I own because 
cash is not a good place to be because if they're going to destroy the dollar, then you can't hold dollars, right? But other central banks have got their interest rates too low too. Every, all the central banks have bought into this Keynesian myth that inflation is good and inflation is necessary. So I don't think cash is going to do it, right? And, and cash is not going to be where you want to be. Like it, in 2008, the reason that cash did well in 2008 was for a while people believed that the government might let everything implode. They thought that they would let banks fail. Now, I didn't think that that was going to happen. They should have done that, but they printed money. And I think it did, nobody is going to worry about failure because the banks that the government said, we will print as much as necessary. We will print whatever it takes. So it's going to be a collapse of cash and also, to a greater extent, a collapse of bonds because even if the central banks print enough money to prevent interest rates from rising. See, the Federal Reserve can print money and buy treasuries all it wants. So it can keep the price of treasuries from collapsing. But it can't stop the dollar from collapsing. And all the treasuries are, are IOU dollars. And so if the Fed is going to destroy the dollar to save the treasuries, then the treasuries die too. And the problem is that if the Fed is buying treasuries and people realize that the inflation is getting out of the, you know, the genie is out of the bottle, well, the Fed might be able to keep treasury rates down, but what about muni rates? What about corporate bonds, right? Those rates are going to start to skyrocket. Well, the municipalities can't afford higher rates, they'll default. Corporations can't afford higher rates. So if the Fed is going to try to keep rates down across the spectrum, the Fed has to buy everything. They have to start blowing up their balance sheet and buy every piece of dollar-denominated debt. And the more the Fed prints to buy bonds that nobody wants, the more they have to print because now they make them less attractive. So you can't be in bonds and you can't be in dollars. So the answer to your question is we, we, we're taking an approach of we're trying to find the countries in the world that are the least screwed up, right? Nobody's perfect. Nobody is America, you know, in the, 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 you know, in the 19th century. There's no bastion of free market, laissez-faire capitalism. Nobody's on the gold standard, right? So it's a question of which countries are screwing up the least. Right? And there are those countries. I mean, there are countries that we invest in, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, uh, you know, Norway, Australia. I mean, there's some, some countries in Latin America, Southeast Asia, China, uh, you know, South Korea, you know, some of the other you know, uh, um, East Asian economies. Um, and we, we like to buy equities, good value stocks, not pie in the sky stuff with high PEs, low PEs, high dividend yield, real value, real assets, real plant and equipment, real resources. And I want to have my customers, right? I want my customers to be the consumers of the future, not the consumers of the past. So you don't want to be in companies where American, Americans are their big customers. Why? Because Americans are broke. They can only buy if they can borrow. And those days are numbered, right? So you want to find countries where consumers are working hard and saving. Countries that have high savings rates, lots of uh, production, trade surpluses, right? These are the consumers of the future, the producers. America only consumes because other people are foolish enough to give us their production. At one point, Americans were the world's biggest consumers because we were the world's biggest producers, because we had the least amount of government, the fewest ta lowest taxes, the fewest regulations. We're not that country anymore. We have a reputation for good capitalism, but we don't actually have it anymore, right? And, and so we want to we wanna be in the countries that are going to, you know, get, that are going to be the winners in this realignment of purchasing power. So we buy a lot of stocks. We also recommend gold, gold stocks, and gold stocks have been clobbered. We've had like 10% allocations to gold stocks, which have been clobbered recently. But you know, ultimately, these are the stocks. The, 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 this is the subprime trade, uh, you know, of the next five years. If you want to make the 10 bagger, the 20 bagger. Right? If you want to do something that could really set you apart, is you buy those stocks. Right? You buy the stocks that nobody wants. Everybody, why does everybody assume that gold's going to collapse? Because they figure, well, you know, the problems have been solved. QE is over, so gold should go back to where it started. You know? But no, QE isn't over. It's just begun. There's a lot more. They're going to print a lot more money than they've already printed. Right? They have to, right? unless they're going to be responsible unless they're going to you know, allow everything to collapse. But why, if they were going to do that, they would have done it already. And I don't think, especially in the next couple of years, Janet Yellen wants to be reappointed as Fed chairman. There's no Republican president who's going to reappoint her. So her only hope is Hillary. 
So what does she want to do? She wants to make sure that we don't have a massive recession on her watch. Well, what's the only thing that Janet Yellen thinks she can do to stop that? Print money. Do a bigger stimulus. See, if, if we go back into recession, it's just going to prove that Paul Krugman was right, right? Oh, the stimulus wasn't big enough. We almost had it. It almost worked. It just wasn't big enough. We, we, would, we would have got escape velocity if we just printed a couple more trillion. And, and that's what they're going to do. Because they can't admit the opposite. They can't admit that the whole program was misguided and that the Fed has made it worse. And now that we have to suffer, we have to, we have to swallow this bitter tasting medicine to get healthy ahead of the 2016 elections. No, it's going to be more snake oil, more something for nothing, you know, more feel good policies that don't work. Um, you know, so you got to be in equities, buy these gold stocks, buy gold. And, you know, we're in the right currencies, you know, recognizing that, look, there's problems in the yen, there's problems with the euro. Um, you know, we're not the only central bank that's printing too much money. Um, but there are other central banks that are printing a lot less, you know. And, and some of those currencies have come down recently based on the expectation that the Fed is about to jack rates up. It's not. There's no way that's happening. And that's how you make a lot of money, right? How do you make a lot of money investing? You figure out what everybody else is doing wrong, and then you bet against it. But in order to do that successfully, you've got to be willing to be wrong before you're right because you can never time it perfectly. You know, how long was I wrong shorting the subprime market before it went my way? Not that long, but how long was I wrong renting? I rented for years while that bubble inflated. And it took a while, people would make fun of me. How long are you gonna rent, Peter? How much money are you gonna, I don't care, as long as it takes. <clears throat> I didn't mind, I, I was renting nice houses and it was costing me less than my landlords. Most of my landlords that rented from me had negative carry on the property. The only reason they thought they were making money was on the appreciation. But that went away. So you got to be willing to be wrong. But if you want to you know, make a lot of money and you want to ultimately be the hero, that's what you have to do. But you've got to also prepare clients because, hey, you, know, you might have to have you know, below returns for a while to make, you know, before, you, before you ultimately get paid. Because in the short run, prices are determined by what the masses believe. And if everybody is wrong and if everybody is making the same mistake, then assets are going to be mispriced. And it becomes a self-perpetuating thing because, you know, the more they are mispriced, the tendency is to keep going in that direction. Because now when people do something wrong and then their wrong bet is ratified in the market, hey, I, I overpaid for something and then it, got, it went higher, well, I must be smart. I must have been right. Let me do more. Right? And now people who were worried about it, well, gee, I didn't buy it and it went up. Well, I guess I was wrong. Maybe I'll buy it now. They get greedy. You know, greed takes over. First, you know, when, when you see something, I don't want to buy that. That's too expensive. You're afraid. But eventually the fear becomes greed. God, I got to buy it. I can't miss out. You just got to fight against that. And you just got to wait for the fundamentals to, to, to reemerge. They always do. And, and then you get the big payday. You know, and everybody else ends up collapsing. And they, and they just say, well, you know, nobody could have seen this coming. You know, oh, well, well, yes, I lost half your money, but so did everybody else. So, I mean, nobody else could have done any better because who could have seen this coming, right? If you want to be the guy that said, yeah, I did. I did see it coming, and I did the right thing. But it is hard in the short run. The easiest thing you can do as a money manager is follow the herd. Because nobody, you know, as long, if, then you don't underperform in the short run. And then when it, and when it blows up, well, you know, happened to everybody. I couldn't, it couldn't be helped, right? That's the safe play. Do what everybody else is doing. The hard part is to be the guy that knows what's going on and, 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 and go against the herd. And maybe you have to answer for it for a while. I had to hold a lot of hands for clients in 1998, 1999, including, including my mother. My mother was pissed at me in 99 because she didn't own dot-com stocks. All her friends were getting rich. And then, of course, they, they lost the money. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Well, that's what they've done, right? They've been pushing it down the road, but it didn't stop the financial crisis from happening. We still, we still had that big event. So they, they can't, it's not, it's not a smooth road. It's a, it's a very bumpy road. But the, at the point is eventually you do run out of road. You cannot do it forever. And that is, I think, the mistake that people are making or the arrogance of assuming that it can go on forever or at least go on long enough that it'll, you know, we don't have to worry about it. And for politicians, you know, generally their horizon is the next election. So for a lot of politicians, you know, it, as long as they can keep it through the, through the term, you know, the, you know, they'll deal with it, you know, later. But 
I think that the events that started in 2008 were really the wake-up call. That was the beginning of the end. We had already been doing this for 30 years or 40 years. The problems in the American economy didn't come here overnight, right? Our industrial base has been disintegrating for years. Our trade deficits and our, uh, and our current account deficits have been building for years. This, this transformation from a legitimate saving, investing, productive economy to a financially engineered bubble, this has been going on for a long time. You know, and, we've, and, and, and we've supported it you know, by women entering the labor force. I mean, remember, at one point in America, married women did not work. Right? Why didn't they work? Because their husband had a job. And if your husband had a job, you didn't need one. Even if your husband didn't even have a high school degree, he had a job and he could support you. And three or four kids. And save for retirement. So what's kept this going? We sent all the women into the workforce, and now some of them are working two jobs. Um, and then we borrowed a ton of money. America used to be the world's biggest creditor nation. We were loaning money to everybody because we had enormous surpluses. Now we're the world's biggest debtor. We've blown through all of our surpluses, and now we owe more money than the rest of the world combined. So we've, we, we've used the, the labor of women and the savings of the Japanese and the, the Chinese and the, and, and, and the Indians and everybody. So we, you know, we've maxed out our credit cards. We've mortgaged our house. You know, I mean, we really can't send our kids into the workforce. So, I mean, we're out of the rope. There's nothing left. We're at the end of the game here. And, you know, whether it's going to happen in a year or two or three, it's hard, you know, even if it's got another five years, which I doubt. But in the scheme of things, you're managing people's money. You know, you've got a 10, 20-year time horizon. It's going to happen on now. So you've got to understand the way the world's going to change and, 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 and get yourself positioned the right way. I mean, it's going to be, this is going to be a bigger change. I mean, America took over the leadership from Great Britain. You know, there was probably a lot of money, fortunes made and lost, you know, during, during the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, right, at the end of the 19th century, when America was the emerging power and Britain was the, was, the, was the falling power. You have to understand how these dynamics are going to change. And, and this is the time period where it's happening. Right? And, the, the, you know, everybody's got interest rates at zero for a reason. This is unprecedented. You've never had a situation. This is the end of this fiat monetary system, where you have a monetary system based on nothing. The world has never done this before. You have to have gold. You have to have real money. We've never done this. I mean, there's been individual countries that have experimented with paper money for hundreds of years. Since they, they invented paper, governments have tried to make money out of paper. It's never worked. It's always ended in disaster. But this time, we've done it on a global scale, and it's going to be a global disaster. But the biggest beneficiary, to the extent you want to call it that, of the current monetary system is the, do is the U.S., because we get to issue the reserve currency. But it hasn't really helped us because it's been like a drug, right? We feel good, but it's allowed our economy to collapse in a way that it couldn't have. Because if we were on a gold standard or we weren't the reserve currency, the market would have forced discipline on the United States decades ago. We would have had to put a stop to these problems. The only reason the economy is so screwed up is because we got all this rope to hang ourselves with. And that's what we did with it. Yeah, well, real estate is going to be tough. Commercial real estate, first of all, if you own um, rental property, I mean, if you have uh, retail, there's going to be disaster there because when the dollar crashes, America's shopping days are over, right? I mean, so the stores are going to be empty because there's going to be nothing to stock the shelves, right? All this, if there's a retailer, Whatever he's selling wasn't made here, made in some other country, and it's going to be too expensive to import. So I think you're going to have a lot of vacancies in strip malls and shopping centers. And so I think probably the worst real estate to own is going to be retail. Second would maybe be office, um, because a lot of the service sector jobs are also going to go away without the industry. I mean, industrial space, warehouse, you know, you know, that is going to have to come back. Farmland, agriculture land, uh, you know, land for minerals, you know, mineral rights, things like that. Some type of property can gain in value. But retail should be bad. And then, 
you know, offices, because a lot of these offices, financial service, and a lot of these occupations, you know, lawyers, you know, we can't afford these types of jobs. We, the country is going to have to transition back towards manufacturing, production, and so, you know, different types of property will, will, will have value. But also you got to look at interest rates, because if interest rates do go up, if the government does allow interest rates to go up, then, you know, your real estate's going to collapse. If, on the other hand, because interest rates going up would be so painful, which it would, we end up with massive inflation. And so the question is now is, well, what about your tenant? Well, your tenant, because you, you might have leases, and your leases are locked in. You know, you've got long-term leases, and what are those lease payments going to be worth if there's massive inflation? You know, so I think that you don't want to have real estate. I, I just can't think of any ways. The only way that real estate really works is if it's really levered up, if you've borrowed a lot of money against it, but your loan is really long-term. And, and most people don't have, unless it's your own house and you've got a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage, a lot of commercial loans are five-year loans. They're short-term loans. Um, but the tenants, if you have long-term leases, they might have 10, 20-year leases. And, you know, the clauses, you know, so I just think there's a lot of ways to lose in real estate, particularly if you're in like a California market. I mean, some of the markets probably have further to fall than others based on what kind of economy they have. If your economy is very financial oriented or real estate, I mean, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of problems there. Um, so I, I think that if you're going to be in the real estate market, you don't want to be in the real estate market in America. You know, it's a big world out there. There's properties that you can own. If you don't want to own an individual property and, and, and be responsible for it, there are publicly traded companies uh, like REITs, you know, in Asia and, you know, Australia and other countries where you can be in the property market and have a much better real return and get your rents in, you know, in another currency that are going to be, uh, you know, that are going to have better purchasing power in the future. Residential real estate, too, I think, in, even in, in most countries, I think residential real estate is expensive. I think that, that that has been one of the assets. Anything that has benefited from the bubble, right? And a lot of people, when they make a purchase of real estate, they don't pay for it with cash. They use borrowed money. And so the more plentiful the, the credit is, the cheaper it is. And I think what's going to have to happen is a reallocation of credit. I mean, right now, it's easy for home buyers to get mortgages uh, because the governments guarantee those. And, and so, you know, people can get a mortgage to buy a house, but a businessman can't get a loan uh, to invest in new equipment because there's no money there. It's all been diverted through government guarantees and through the Fed to the financial economy and the consumer economy away from the real economy. And so that has to change. When the government gets out of the way and capital gets reallocated, it's going to be capital investment that's going to be funded, real productive assets, and Money for houses is not going to be there. Money for consumer loans like automobiles. I mean, we've inflated this huge uh, bubble in the auto market with uh, government-financed car loans and subprime car loans. That, that business is going to come to an end. When that bubble burst, the, the last cars that Americans bought, you know, the, whatever, the 2014s, the 2015s, they'll be in the road, on the road in 10 or 20 years. I mean, when this bubble burst, Americans' days of buying cars are pretty much going to be over. Um, and in fact, a lot of the cars are going to be shipped over to China the, and, you know, in exchange for bicycles because a lot of Americans aren't going to be able to afford to drive the cars and they're going to need to sell them anyway. But, you know, we, we've had this whole bubble of consuming, consuming, consuming on credit and, and printing and, and all that has to come to an end. And when you recognize that, right, and recognize what is the world going to look like, right, after that, get your money there first, right? Find out how the world is going to look. And, and then invest there. I mean, people used to say to me, they think, did, did I have a time machine? They'd say, how could I, if you watched my, my YouTube video, 2005 or 2006, you would think that I was recording it in 2009. I mean, I have yet to see somebody give a better explanation of what happened in 2008 than my explanation in 2006, right? So people say, well, Peter, what, did you have a time machine? How did you do that? No, I just, I just was thinking clearly. You don't have to be clairvoyant, have a time machine, or even be that smart. Because I'm most smarter than anybody else, but you just have to, you know, keep, you know, keep your thoughts clear, and just don't get influenced or clouded by the hysteria, the mania around you. And if you do that, and you see clearly what's going to happen, you can position yourself so that when it does happen, you benefit from it. All right. Thanks.